All right. Um, how's the echoing at the moment? Is this okay? All right. Excellent. Well, thanks for coming to this, and uh, yeah, thanks um, for that talk. It really actually quite nicely sets the scene. Sam and I, not just colleagues, we're in the office beside one another, and uh, we come from very different backgrounds, though. And the focus of our talks are really going to be quite different. Although maybe towards the end, I'll loop back and come close to addressing maybe some of the questions that came up in this Q and A session. So there'll be some nice, interesting overlaps here. Now, I'm a cognitive psychologist. I'm interested in human perception, really kind of fundamental stuff, not really interested in sport or, you know, and until really quite late in my career. And, you know, you might wonder why someone might spend a bit of time thinking about human perception. It's, it's a really kind of fairly abstract thing for many people to imagine considering. But, but actually, human perception is probably the most important thing that psychology as a discipline Many of you won't even consider this part of psychology as you conceptualize it, but really probably the most important thing psychology as a discipline has contributed to the wider society. So, you know, I work in sports science departments, um, clearly working with people and interested in people learning new skills in the context of sports. We're interested in how you learn new things. We're interested in how you do things like differentiate experts from novices? What are these sort of fundamental things that change these people? And, and obviously one of the things that separates individuals across the course of their learning, but also you know, throughout their lifetime, is their ability to perceive the world and their ability to perceive some of the real subtleties of some of the sports that underpin their ability to make these sort of incredible Roger Federer-esque movements. There are many facets of human development uh, that are a big feature of psychology, medicine, education, things like dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, things that you wouldn't necessarily consider as perceptual, but actually there's a large body of research suggesting that there are perceptual differences between these different sorts of populations and more typically developing populations, really fundamental low-level things about how they see or experience the world around them that could have interesting knock-on effects to later life social or motor control difficulties. It's been estimated that roughly 50% of your brain is devoted to perceiving the world around you. So this means there's huge scope out there for you after some sort of head injury, some sort of uh, brain damage, some sort of lesion, stroke, um, to have damage to your perceptual abilities. And people end up being blind or unable to perceive parts of the world simply after having damaged the parts of their brain. And if we want to understand how to fix these damaged brain areas, we've got to understand how these systems work. But most relevant for the audience today, I suspect, will be in the realm of technology creation. Things like robotics, remote robotics, face recognition, and the design of immersive virtual reality systems. All of these are based on fundamental understandings of human perceptions. Ultimately, these systems are all developed by engineers doing psychophysics, the study of sort of human perception in a really low-level controlled way. And this is kind of the real main overlap that I've sort of become interested in in the last few years. So that's, that's kind of a research cell, but, but actually most of my public-facing stuff, you know, what I do for public engagement, focuses around illusions. And that's because I'm, I'm hugely interested in illusions, and I think that, generally speaking, people of the world are quite interested in this too. So if you want a formal definition of an illusion, it's where perception deviates from an objectively measurable reality. So we will experience these illusions. I suspect everyone here has messed around on the internet and you know, clicked on some cool links on Reddit or something like that. But, you know, what I'm hoping to do here is show you some of the ones that I think are the most interesting and then maybe sort of shed light on how these tell us some things about the brain. So this is a really nice illusion of, of brightness here. And, you know, it almost looks as if the center of these circles here are kind of glowing. It almost hurts your eyes to stare at them, especially on a really big screen like this. But actually, this is just as white as the stuff outside the circle. They're exactly the same luminance. This kind of glowing in the middle is completely illusory. Illusions, however, that mess around with our ability to perceive shape are in many ways the most compelling. And you can put this up here, right? And, but this really needs some explanation, because actually, these blue lines here, even though they look all tilted and wonky, are completely parallel to one another. So, you know, you can sit and stare at that and you're like, ah, no way. But actually, you know, sort of look at the top and the bottom of these, these lines here. And you can kind of see they don't really deviate from the edge of something that is clearly a rectangle here. 
is a fairly famous version of something called the Cafe Wall Illusion that was discovered in Bristol on, interestingly enough, the side of the Cafe Wall. This is another illusion that's fairly similar called the Fraser Wilcox illusion here, where again, all of these things, all of these lines that you see going diagonally down the screen, they're completely parallel to one another as well. They aren't converging or diverging at all. Any of that convergence or divergence is completely illusory. This is one of my favorites here. What we've got here are two concentric circles, a big one and a small one. They aren't tangled up with one another, they aren't about to bump into one another, they aren't some sort of helix shape or anything like that. It really is just a small circle, a slightly larger, bigger circle. But because of the, um, the contours or the changing of the gradients, the blacks and the whites in here, it really creates this powerful effect that they're curled into one another. This one looks incredibly dramatic on a small screen. On a big screen, it probably depends a little bit about where you're sitting in the room, but you might get this pretty dramatic three-dimensional effect going on here, where it almost looks like that diamond at the front is leaping out. Maybe it's moving somewhat independently from the background. Illusions like this, we don't really have a good understanding of why they affect people the way that they do, and why there are such differences. I mean, there are some people in this room who will feel really quite nauseous with especially if you turn your heads and try to catch it out the corner of your eye, it really affects your kind of peripheral vision quite dramatically. <laughs> it's a nice little motion illusion. You can always tell when people experience these sorts of ones because they kind of visibly uh, jerk back. So you might imagine this is a GIF or something like that, something animated, but this is a completely static image. I'm not going to be showing you any animated things during this talk. These are completely static images, and any movement that you see here is completely driven by some combination of movements of your eye and something the colors are doing to your visual system. Again, these effects are not very well understood, and they are generated really by artists, who, people who are the, sort of the nexus of perceptual science and art. This is a very famous one called the Rotating Snakes Illusion. This is one that you'll see on pretty much any illusion demonstration or presentation you come across. Created by pretty much the father of visual illusions as far as I'm concerned. Again, a very powerful effect. And almost all of the vision science research that is done on visual illusions is done looking at this display. Looking at how people move their eyes around it, taking away colors, saturating the colors and things like that. And you can make the illusion go a little bit faster, a little bit slower. But again, its mechanisms are still fairly poorly understood. This one I like well enough to throw up in my lectures when I'm giving perception lectures to kind of wake the students up. Because this is a pretty dramatic motion illusion where different parts of the uh, image seem to almost curl up and jump around. And this one kind of took the internet by storm a few years ago as well, using a sort of combination of nice motion tricks and a little bit of some of these nice depth cues as well. It's created a sense that this thing is almost rotating around. But again, this is a completely static image here. Particularly well if you maybe move your eyes around the scene a bit. This is my personal favorite illusion because it sort of combines two different effects. You've got a little bit of an emotion illusion here going on. It looks as if the squares are slightly tilting and moving to one another. And it also looks as if the squares are kind of wonky, but they're actually all completely parallel to one another. There are obviously some small local elements that are not completely symmetrical, but the overall squares themselves are not tilted, they're completely straight, parallel, up and down. So, you know, this pretty much could be the talk I give, just presenting a PowerPoint slide of visual illusions. But there needs to be some sort of hook. We need to understand why we care about visual illusions and what is the, the point of examining these things. Well, different visual illusions have really shed light on some of the fundamental workings of the human visual system. This is uh, an illusion called the scintillating grid, and it probably looks to you like you see these black squares, these white lines, these white circles, and in some of these white circles, in your more peripheral vision, you might see these sort of grey flashy dots that you can never really get a proper glimpse of, because they're not really there. Nothing is flashing on this display, there are no grey dots in the middle of these white circles, they are simply white circles. But the fact that you keep seeing these illusory grey dots in your more peripheral vision, uh, it's been used to understand the makeup of the retina, the wall of cells at the back of your eye that really process uh, the visual information. And the receptive fields that all of these different visual cells have change in their density in the central part of our eye, which we call the fovea, and the more peripheral parts of our eye. 
So this gets kind of fairly heavy cognitive psychology lecture material, but I'm much more interested in the illusions that tell us something about the human brain, because ultimately as a psychologist rather than a physiologist, that's what I'm interested in here. So this is a fairly famous illusion, developed back in the 1990s by a guy called Edward Adelson at MIT, called the Checker Shadow Illusion. It's a pretty unassuming display here, it needs a bit of explanation. And the illusion, for those of you who haven't seen it before, is that this square here, labelled A, is exactly the same luminance as the square labelled B. So, you know, you're not really going to believe that, right? It's pretty clear, looking at this, that A is significantly darker than B. But actually, they are physically, as far as the output of the light, completely the same. It's just simply your visual systems interpreting them as different colours. So, okay, let, let's maybe just take away the rest of the display. Let's just leave A and B there. Okay, so they look the same there, put the rest of the display back, kind of flick back and forth. But, okay, this is just a guy with PowerPoint flicking back and forth between things. I could be doing anything between these slides. So let's go for a more compelling demonstration. Let's add the information in, bit by bit, square by square. Add in the information relating to the three-dimensionality of the image. Add in the information relating to the shadow in that image that is really the sort of fundamental cause of the illusion. You can start to see that even though A and B look the same at the beginning, the difference in their luminance starts to evolve, and there'll probably be a switch point for each and every one of you here, at which they do look really quite different likenesses to one another. So this is not an effect that is a consequence of our eyes, or even really our visual system. This is our brain making unconscious deductions about the world around us. Something that some perceptual scientists called unconscious inf inference. And this is really, we're going around all the time making, you know, automatic deductions about how the light that we see bouncing off things must have been generated based on the context that's all around here. So here are things like the three-dimensionality, the fact that it's a checkerboard, the fact that it seems like there should be a shadow being cast by this big three-dimensional thing all contribute to the perception that this is going to be lighter than this, even though they're exactly the same luminance. And our brain is filling in the gaps all the time, the things that are, you know, just the most common thing that we see. It's pretty clear that we don't go around seeing the inside of boxes very often, but we do see the outside of boxes very often. So, when the information is ambiguous, as it is here, it's actually pretty clear that this thing looks like it's the outside of a cube pointing towards you. Until that becomes very clear that it's the inside of the cube, you see no ambiguity whatsoever. And this is the basis of a really nice phenomenon called the hollow face illusion, which, uh, given that we're coming up to Halloween, you're going to be experiencing quite a lot of in the near future. And it's basically your inability to understand and visually resolve looking at the inside of a face mask. Because we spend our whole lives looking at the outside, the sort of convex part of people's faces, but we never see the inside of the concave part. So next time you're in a joke shop at Halloween or a Halloween shop, have a look at the masks, take one, hold it at arm's length, and flip it around, and then take a few steps back from it, and it'll look all of a sudden as if it's pointing out towards you rather than the inside of the mask. There's a really nice sort of illusory demonstration you can do yourself, and it creates these slightly ghastly horrifying rotating images of hollow faces here, where it almost looks like the mask eats itself. You might think this is a computer animated thing, but actually this is just a cutout. There's a little link that I've got below here that I can give you all to go on Instructable and create one of these yourself. So that's really worth watching again, I think. So this thing is a completely hollow image of a dragon. It's never moving, it's never following you around. Your visual system is simply interpreting it as hollow until there. It looks like the inside of a dragon, rather than the outside following your head around. So a really powerful effect here. We almost can't interpret the inside surfaces of objects when we see the outside surface over and over again. So, our prior knowledge is supplementing our information from our senses all the time, and this is just critical for successful perception. And this does create some nice 
strange experiences in certain circumstances. This is a chap called Richard Wiseman, who's a psychologist and magician at Edinburgh. Playing with our notion that things can be the same size in our retina if they're far away or they are smaller than they actually may be. But ultimately our expectations of size are what kind of dominate our initial experience of this video. And for any of you who have been to perhaps Camera Obscura up in Edinburgh, the famous Museum of Illusions, you come across these effects like this Ames room here. It's a really nice effect where it looks as if the chap on the left is really, really small and the chap on the right is large. And they're changing sizes as they walk from one side of the room to the other. But of course this isn't what's happening. These people are not magically growing or shrinking. And actually the trickery here is just based on the fact that we spend our lives in rooms that have parallel side walls and a flat back. So here they've created a room with a wonky floor, different sized walls and different sized, a sort of trapezoid shape if you like. And when an individual is staring through a little peephole at the front to really force their perspective from that certain viewpoint, limit their information, they get this really powerful effect that the person who is over here, who is over here, is actually a whole lot smaller than they actually are, due to this kind of forced perspective idea. And these ideas are not new, and really not even invented by psychologists. The, the movie industry has been playing around with forced perspective for a long time. If you ever wonder how Gandalf got bigger than Frodo in Lord of the Rings, it's no computer graphic trickery. It's creating rooms with funny layouts and funny shapes, and having them at different distances from the camera whilst appearing to converse with one another. So, you know, really low-tech and really compelling way to create these visual perception effects. This is something I still can't really wrap my head around. This is something called Ames Window. This was developed by the same chap who developed the Ames Room back in you know, eight, uh, 1970. And you might think this is a computer graphic, but this is a thing, a piece of cardboard with a ruler in between it, dangling from a string, spinning around. And it just blows my mind trying to figure out what on earth is going on in this image. But again, we are interpreting this as if it is a rectangular window, because that's kind of what it looks like, when it's in fact a trapezoid shape. But when it spins around, and our perspective and that sensory information gets all confused with our prior expectations, it creates this bizarre effect where it looks as if the ruler kind of disappears through the middle of the window or something like that. So it's not just our vision that gets affected by our prior knowledge. All of our senses um, really have to deal with our brain chipping in here and helping out. So I'll play some sound. Kind of garble sounding, right? So what I'll do now is I'll put some words up on the screen. I'll take them away. And you're going to hear exactly the same sound again. I have fundamentally altered your perception now. You are never able to hear that as garbled nonsense ever again. You will always hear this as your handwriting is very difficult to read. And this is the sort of the power of the scaffolding of your cognitive perception underneath your, your cognitive expectations underneath your perception. Now, some people are not that impressed at the idea of our vision or our sound being affected by illusion, because these are, these are waves that are traveling through a medium to get to us. So there's plenty of time for things to get distorted. But actually our sense of touch is just as uh, amenable to our prior expectations as any of our other senses. And that, that for many people is quite a distressing thing. You know? If we're holding something in our hands, it's real, it's believable, it's, you know, it's the ground truth. But actually it's really not. And a large part of the research I do is in the context of something called the size-weight illusion. Now the size-weight illusion is where you have objects of different sizes from one another, which is these two cubes here, that have been adjusted to weigh the same amount. So they're both filled up with chunks of lead. They both weigh, in this case, exactly 700 grams. When people pick these things up and give a number to say how heavy it is, they will typically say the big thing feels really quite light. Whereas, by contrast, the small thing feels significantly heavier. Let's try it on the other front. It's nice and to do this. 
So you can pick them up one at a time, you can pick them up in the... Yeah? Is it small and feels heavier? <laughs> I would pass these round, but to be honest, there's probably too many people in the room for this to happen, but there'll be a nice you know, opportunity after this to come and experience this for yourself, so this feels a bit less abstract. It's actually one of the most powerful perceptual effects in psychology. A really, really compelling thing that's been around for well over 100 years. And it's, it's ubiquitous. I mean, almost everyone in this room is going to experience that that small thing feels heavier than that big thing. And it's persistent. You know, so I was introduced to this probably a decade and a half ago now, and I still experience this illusion just as powerfully as I did the first time around. And also, the fact that you're listening to me give a talk about this will have no impact on your experience of the illusion either. Uh, your knowledge of the effect doesn't make it go away, something we refer to as being cognitively impenetrable. It's experienced by children who are, you know, young enough to be able to talk about this kind of stuff. And it doesn't seem to decline in old age. And we go to this in people who are 90 odd years old. And they still, even though they have sort of degraded sensory input in their fingertips, experience just as robust a size weight illusion as everyone else would. And this illusion is something to do with our prior expectations. We expect the big thing is going to be heavier than the small thing, because that's how stuff normally is in the real world. Big stuff normally weighs more than small things. So what we experience with that small object is that that's heavier than I expected it to be. The big object is lighter than you expected it to be. So it's that integration of your prior expectations with your sensory input that you end up experiencing with this. So this is kind of where we drag ourselves into the world of VR. Because I'm a big believer here that virtual reality is going to be the big next step in science the science of understanding the human senses. And I just want to talk about a little simple study I did using immersive virtual reality to answer the fairly simple question of which of our senses we trust the most with regards to this illusion. Because you can experience this illusion and get a sense of how big these objects are by looking at them. It's easy to see this bigger than this. Or I can close my eyes and I can feel that this one is bigger than this. Now, it's well known that in both of these cases, you'll experience a robust size weight illusion. You'll experience that that small thing feels heavier than the big thing. But we don't know which of our senses we trust the most in this context. And this is really important for developing uh, human computer interfaces, for example. So, immersive virtual reality allowed me to take these cues and put them in direct conflict with one another. Because we can have people interacting with things that we have complete control over what it is they happen to be seeing. And uh, in my lab at Exeter, down at the St. Louis campus, we've developed this nice setup here where individuals are able to interact with physical things in their environment while we track the position of these things using uh, optical motion tracking cameras. And then we essentially display a drawing of those things, these little cylinders up here, into the headset of a virtual reality uh, head-mounted display here in Oculus Rift. So this person is moving these things around and they feel like they're moving around the things that they're seeing. It's all happening at pretty much zero latency through a LAN cable. So we got our participants to experience the size weight illusion with this sort of setup, picking up objects that are, you know, either look the different sizes from one another or are different sizes from one another, but all the same mass in one of three different conditions. Essentially where we use VR to create a simulation of the real world, lifting up three different things that look as if they have three different sizes. A situation where we get rid of those visual size differences. So three physically different things are being picked up, but they all look as if they have the same size. Or the final condition where the things are all exactly the same size. Three identical objects, basically, that look as if they have different sizes. So whether the size weight illusion, your perception, can be messed around with in virtual reality in this way. No one spent a whole lot of time talking about the experiment itself, other than to cut to the chase of the results, in that you experience a size weight illusion in all of these conditions, but it's not exactly the same magnitude of size weight illusion. So if I'm picking up three identical things that look different because of what VR is telling me, it's a pretty small size weight illusion. We don't believe our eyes all that much. If the objects all look exactly the same size but feel different sizes, it's a much bigger size weight illusion, almost twice as large. 
So we believe our hands telling us something is bigger than the other, a lot more than we believe our eyes telling us. And if we have both our hands and our eyes telling us these objects are different sizes, it's the biggest size weight illusion yet. Perhaps not that surprising, but what this really does tell us quite nicely is that the more information you provide people in virtual reality, particularly related to touch, something that's really lacking in the world of VR at the moment, as was alluded to in Sam's talk earlier, um, that's really how we lead to these most compelling sorts of experiences of real-world style effects. All right, so that's really all I wanted to talk about today. Uh, a few take-home messages of, you know, we don't experience the physical properties of our world around us. Our, our brains are constantly contributing to our experience of the world. And you can experience illusions in virtual reality, but they vary in strength, depending on what sort of information, what quality of information you provide people. And perhaps, maybe flipping this around, we can start thinking about using illusions like this, or other real perceptual phenomena, as a, a way to test people's immersion in particular virtual environments. If we want to test which of the two virtual environments is more immersive, more realistic to the participant, we can go this sort of step beyond simply asking them how immersed they are and look at how they experience these more unusual real-world perceptual phenomena. But thank you very much for listening. I'd love to take any questions you have as well. Um, Sam and I, I guess, are going to hang around for a little while to take questions. I've got some demonstrations of these illusions that I talked about here, these sideways illusions, and then a whole bunch of printouts of some of these visual illusions as well, which for me are much more interesting than looking at them on a computer screen or really anything you can happen. So yeah, thanks again for your time. Shall we take a couple of, couple of questions? Yeah, sure. There? Um, regarding these weights, you said that the, the way they fail, it depends on our prime knowledge or... Yeah. But you explicitly said that they are the same way. Yeah, yeah. So, isn't that the kind of prior knowledge of... Yeah. So, still though, yeah. our, our perception is affected. It's so a great question. I mean, what we have is we have lots of different <coughs> types of prior knowledge. We've got the stuff we explicitly can understand and can access, the stuff we can talk about. But then we've got the stuff that we don't really have any conscious access to. And this is probably built up simply by experience in a world where big things normally weigh more than small things. So it's useful for us to be able to snap back to this idea that this is probably going to be heavier than this, because it will be in 99% of the cases. Even though I told you these are the same ways, there's still some part of your sensory motor system that thinks it's probably not very useful to believe me. Because if I'm lying, statistically, you're going to be at a disadvantage. Yep. You talked about the fact that, that people perceive the world in, in different ways and that different conditions can influence that. Um, do you know what sort of things contribute to people seeing visual illusions more or less strongly? Because a lot of them might don't see the illusion, yeah. especially the motion ones. Mm. I generally don't see the motion. So I'm curious, do you know what sort of things influence that? No, no. The short answer is we don't know yet. And it's one of those really interesting things because some people experience some types of illusions really robustly, but this doesn't predict whether they're going to experience another class of illusions uh, really robustly either. So, you know, there are some people who believe everything because they're naive, and some people who have this ground access to the truth. There are some fundamental things about our visual system that probably change, but it's nothing that we can easily measure. It doesn't seem to be something about how we move our eyes or how fast we move our eyes or anything like that. I have there some studies talking about how well we're able to keep our eyes still, and we're never keeping our eyes still. We're always shaking our eyes just a little bit. And the degree to which it shakes around a little bit might be one of these predictors that drives that rotating snake's motion illusion I showed you back at the beginning. But this field is completely in its infancy at the moment. Despite, you know, in many ways being over 100 years old, the individual differences of these effects are just not well known for this whole world. Just a curiosity, uh, have you tested this same experiment but having like surfaces different? Because they look the same, so if one looked like cardboard and the other one looked like steel, would yeah. that make a difference as well? Yeah, that's uh, an illusion that's been described called material weight illusion. So yeah. the size weight illusion, that's the material weight illusion. works with this, exactly the same rationale when you expect one thing over the other. The weird thing is it's probably only about a quarter of the size of the size weight illusion. 
This is the best perceptual illusion you can come across. This is so much better than making one look as if it's metal and one look as if it's polystyrene or something like that. And that's weird, right? Because, okay, I expect this is going to be heavier than this, but surely I expect metal is going to be way heavier than polystyrene or cork or something like that. So, you know, this probably comes down to these statistical ideas that we don't really have access to, but, you know, what relationships we encounter in the world that are the most concrete and that we should believe the most, that are the strongest priors that we don't have access to. We have one more question from the gentleman, the rather fabulous uh, <laughs> shirt there. It's not been a visual illusion with your hand going up. <laughs> um, it wasn't a, a specific question about the talk, but something that Sam touched on in the, in the questions to start his talk. And, uh, and Sam said, well, when VR has been gone, which I thought was interesting. Though. So if VR has ever had a limited length of time, what do you think will replace it in the future? So I think in the context of the training space, that's a very different question to the context of experimentation that Gavin's describing. I think VR for experimentation and for science is just beginning, whereas VR for as, as a, a consumer product for training will come and go. Uh, what will replace it? Probably AR or MR of some kind. Um, but I believe it will probably go full circle and come back to realising that real people in the real world is the best way to learn real skills. Um, but that's just an opinion. Now, I, I completely agree with Sam on this as well. I think that VR as a consumer gaming tool, that's going to come and go. I think as a training tool, once we've mapped out its limitations and situations where it's going to work the best, and you know, probably these really dangerous situations where even real world simulation is just not viable, then it's going to have some added value. And as it gets cheaper, that added value will be pretty easy to realize. But as a science tool, this just revolutionizes things as far as I'm concerned. This is, this is the start of a really exciting science journey as far as I'm uh, concerned here. Okay, thank you all very much. It's um, Sam <laughs> Thank you. Those who want to do a bit of live experimentation, ask more questions, do please uh, stay around. Um, for those that don't, please head down to the cafeteria and go and grab your lunch. You're first in the queue. <laughs>